Okay, very welcome everybody. And I want to kind of say, first of all, thank you very much to Matthias for, for agreeing to do the session today, Leadership Not Just for Baby Boomers. Okay, I want to do the menti, uh, menti dot com. I'll put the link in the chat bar. So if everybody could go to the link in the chat bar, please, if you click on the link in the chat bar, and, and complete the, this Mentimeter. This is an evaluation, it's not in a real time one, we won't see the results right now, but it's really just to look at our evaluation post uh, the Future Skills Week in terms of thinking about you know what comes to mind when you think of leadership. So please take a minute or two, just bang in the first things that come to your mind in, in terms of what you consider leadership to be. What comes to mind when you think about leadership, what it is. And then what we'll also do then is we have, uh, Matthias has very kindly set up a Google Docs, which will be in real time. He will be able to see it. I will give you access to that link now. If people could go in, please. If they go into, if you could do the Menti first, that would be much appreciated. Then if you go into the, the Google Docs link that I have sent you, Matthias has set that up so that you can really he can look and see in terms of real time what what people are kind of putting in there in terms of what are the leadership red flags for me how do i want to be led and how will i lead okay so i can see a few people are in there now already i can see there's an anonymous grizzly an anonymous kiwi an anonymous dragon an anonymous iguana an anonymous that's 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 always my favorite that they're giving all those animals so everyone's anonymous but let's see how many people we can get in and if they run out of animals at some point <laughs> I, I i suspect they won't i suspect they won't run out of animals but the it will be very to, very interesting to see the, the moment you get to anonymous skunk probably that's that's where it gets uh, <laughs> that's that that's that's where the issues begin yeah okay so if people can work away looking at the mandy have a go in the end end of the Google Docs then. I'm 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 trying to flick between screens here, so please, please kind of appreciate that. Yes, we we've eight or nine in there. I see we now have an anonymous goose. An Ibex. What's what's an Ibex? Uh mm. aren't they the, the Egyptian birds with the long legs that are in cartouches sometimes, I think. Or I'm really making an idiot Ooh. out of myself here. I think it's oh, like okay. one of those we should have a spot prize for, for somebody who can tell us what an Ibex is. <laughs> it's spelled I-B-E-X. I'll, 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 do, I'll do a quick Google here myself because I, I kind of I thought I knew quite a lot about David Attenborough. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a wild goat. <laughs> so there oh, you go. It? An Ibex okay, well, is a wild goat, several species of wild goat um, found in the region. Someone has Googled that just there. That's that was me. I googled it. it. Oh, I'm sorry. God, well, congratulations. <laughs> I, I, I googled it. So I can see people are working away um, in terms of the Mendy, and I can see people are in your Google Docs. Okay. So look, folks, I want to, I want to talk about uh, a bit about Matthias. I want to introduce the session. Leadership not just for boomers. Okay, Matthias today will explore his experiences with different approaches to leadership and why he thinks that servant leadership as a model can help unlock your career. He also delves into how important resilience is and why it's not just a question of personal development, but one of societal change, which is a really, really important point. The post-COVID high tension world would change us all to rethink and change our perspectives. And Matthias will go in and explore that in a bit more detail. Background to Matthias, I love the photograph of in the ball pit, I have to say. <laughs> very, very good. Oh, expect a rant. Okay, good. We like a good rant. That's, Educated that's in Germany. On resilience. That's, that's specifically, specifically around resilience. resilience. Okay, oh, excellent. Yeah. So, Educated in Germany, the UK and Japan, Matthias holds a master's degree in Japanese studies, intercultural communication and social psychology. 
during his career in the UK, he's worked across the whole student life cycle. This is one of the reasons we, we kind of, when we were targeting people in relation to who we wanted to speak during Future Skills Week, uh, several people, I have to say, Mathias, and I'm not kind of blowing smoke up your backside, but said, look, here's a guy that you, you, you really want talking. <laughs> I'm bringing on. Here's a guy that you want talking. And, and when I kind of looked at, you know, who you were and what you'd done and, you know, kind of some of the stuff that you'd been involved in, I thought, absolutely perfect. And I was so glad when I reached out to you, you had that availability. And I know it's been difficult. You've been changing jobs. And so I just, I want to kind of articulate my appreciation for, for joining us here today. So he's worked across the whole student life cycle from induction through to graduation to alumni status, managed employability placements, enterprise, alumni relations teams, and large public sector universities and niche private institutions, covering subject areas ranging from business, arts and humanities, psychology, psychotherapy, civil aviation. He's a non, his non-executive career includes having been the chair of PlaceNet, Placements and Industry Network, for those of you don't know what place that is, and serving on the Board of Regents University London. He's now working for an EdTech startup with a mission training coders in developing countries. So without further ado then, I will pass you on to Matthias. I want to say thank you very much. I will be in the background here. I'm going to switch off my camera because I'm going to be eating a donut. <laughs> but if, if there's anything <laughs> if there's anything at all, I, I, I certainly will be listening in. Any issues or problems, uh, please, please do do let me know. The chat bar is functional for everybody. So if you have a question or anything you want to put to Matthias or anything you want to say or comment, do do please engage with us. Okay. So thank you very much. And without further ado, drum roll, brrr, Matthias, it's all yours. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, Norman. And I have to say that is of all the online talks I've done, I'm pretty sure this is the, the most amazing intro and you're like a born hype man. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I've got 50 minutes to hopefully not dispel any of the uh, uh, any of the expectations. I just want to do a quick check here with you. I know that you can uh, see me. Can you also clearly hear me? Uh, just in the chat, or if someone's bold enough to say yay or yo uh, out loud, that's fine with me as well. Yup, yup is good, Sylvia. Thank you. Yeah, good, wonderful, I assume. So that means my microphone for once works. Right, okay, so we've got until one o'clock my time, our time, our shared time, because I'm actually not that far from you. I'm uh, just south of the border. Um, I'm in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, that's where I have ended up after many years in different places. Uh, there's a lovely kind of, kind of write-up there with regards to my background, but I thought I'd throw in just a picture there, uh, which kind of describes, this is hand painted by me. It's actually hand painted for a job application I did something like almost two years ago, um, because I wanted to show and talk people through uh, what my background is. Um, yeah, uh, I firmly studied what everyone advised me not to do. And uh, that's a, uh, I'm, it's kind of a point of pride for me, really, because uh, if you're studying and studied back in, in Germany in the, uh, in the 90s, uh, and you study something like Japanese studies with uh, uh, reasonably esoteric uh, minors, you will continuously be told you'll never have a job, including, funnily enough, during induction by one of the professors, uh, in front of an audience and then having two professors basically verbally fight with each other, one saying, oh no, Japan, wonderful uh, economics and business, and the other one saying, no, 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 you'll never have a job. Actually, I always had a job. And if you've been to any one of my other talks um, before, because we've uh, done some before, uh, Evaristo and I, uh, it's always been for me about uh, well, it's a career journey tends to be not about the kind of destination you decide you want to go for, because by the time you're finished, that destination in many cases won't exist. And if you're looking at all the innovation pressures and the technology as it advances and changes business, anyone who's been in Evaristo's talk, and Evaristo's always a hard act to follow, uh, you know that there is no guarantee that whatever you've been told in school, this is a job for the future, go into it, there's a good chance that by the time you have finished your degree, you may be 
confronted with a completely different employment market. This is partially a curious talk because I'm making that connection to a skill and skill set that is expected from people as they graduate. And people get a lot of question about kind of leadership potential as part of application processes. So anyone who's experienced that so far has done an application for junior positions and still gets the occasional question about, well, leadership and leadership potential. It's perfectly fine if you put that into the chat, I will see it. And also that's because quite a lot of our, uh, organizations are looking early on to see potential and to develop potential because the, uh, the war for talent is truly on. And uh, that is, um, oh, uh, that is, oh, in a Slack at work, they're basically saying, oh, 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 oh. they are talking about, oh, I see. Um, I'm going to, uh, just for you to know, because this is the life I'm leading, um, I'm, uh, uh, I am going to invite someone else to this talk. That's my job, because Dean will never encourage me. Put that right in there, Majid, right into the, uh, into the collaborative manifesto document. Right there, that's exactly uh, what we're going to be talking about. Right, uh, this is a link to the previous session. Excellent. Can I ask um, someone of the moderators to do me a favor, please, and send the external guest link and put it into the chat here, because I'm going to invite someone else into the uh, session as we speak. Is that possible, please? Well, I Just will drop do it that. into the chat. That's wonderful that because I can easily drop it in the Slack chat because that's the hipster I am. Okay, <laughs> right, going back, going back in. It's a connection. It's leadership and leadership potential and how off-putting leadership can be. I'm going to make a disclaimer uh, and I should make that disclaimer fairly early on. And that is that, uh, come on, you can do this. Try this. Excellent. Yeah, there we go. Um, the disclaimer is that I'm not going to, I, I, I don't even have a massive structure ahead of you because we're going to create part of this session together. Um, but the disclaimer I want to make is a lot of what I'm going to say is based on personal experience. And some of it is based on opinion pieces or opinions of other people that have influenced me in my view on leadership. So I'm happy to share links to articles or books that I'm going to be quoting, um, but uh, keep in mind, this is not a, an academic seminar in the classic sense. So with that in mind, let's go through what I have prepared for you today. I've uh, pre prepared a bit of a, well, as I said it early on, a bit of a rant probably, about my experiences with different styles of leadership and how they've probably shaped me as someone who has had institutional and organizational leadership roles. Um, the things I don't want to ever do again and the things that I would be happy to do in the future. And I hope that that helps uh, for you as students and, and graduates to go out and decide for yourself what type of leadership you prefer and what type of leadership you would really turn you off. So if someone can repost, perhaps again, the uh, collaborative documents uh, that I've put in, people can write in there. And as the session goes on, I'll be every once in a while, oh goodness, that's already quite a lot. So the things that I want to ask for is what are red leaderships, uh, leadership red flags for me? How do I want to be led? And how will I lead? So those things, please keep them coming because the kind of the last, probably 20 minutes of this session, uh, I'll be diving in there. So we are creating content together. And uh, I hope that uh, that will actually create value for you because please pull this out and use it to build your own little uh, leadership perspective manifesto. I want something tangible to come to you from this session. Um, Yes, I think I've done the disclaimer. I told you roughly who I am. Probably the maybe the occasional anecdote coming in, but I'm very aware that I'm not allowed to swear. And uh, I'm also probably going to anonymize any comments that I'd be 
doing. Now, first part is, uh, the first part on this is the actual content of the session. Uh, I had these set up as GIFs, so they were all basically actually moving all the Allen sugars there. Um, but I wanted to introduce you to the to how the leadership has looked like in many cases that I have been uh, um, that I have observed and had the pleasure of interacting with mostly institutional leaders. Uh, see any similarities? Anyone you want anything you want to put into the chat? Anyone wants to shout out? What do you notice about this leadership and this type of leadership? <laughs> he's a smiler. You're saying like, like this, he's not a happy bunny, yeah? Anyone else? Well, I would argue that also. Ah, hello, male, middle-aged, typical. Yes, that is a, unaware. Okay, yeah, but I think that's actually what we're picking up. Thank you for someone to, he has high expectations. Yes, he has high expectations of you and he will fire you. He will require compliance. Hold that in mind because that will become uh, important later. But uh, yeah, a special prize for, uh, who was it? <laughs> Magnus, old white man, uh, and uh, Moira as well, male, middle-aged, typical. Now that's a really interesting observation uh, because the leadership with which I have been confronted with over all those many years has been most, ca most cases, and I don't mean direct management, but I mean uh, the kind of leadership and executive of the organizations that I work for, yeah, diversity, not so much. And I say that as a middle-aged white man. Hmm. So uh, what can I say? This is something to think about. Um, a lack of diversity. And with a lack of diversity often comes also a lack of diversity with regards to ideas, concepts, and solutions. And that has been something that has fairly consistently frustrated me, if I may say so. Um, and I have learned over the years that there are alternatives to a command and control type of leadership. And let me see which slide. So yeah, perfect. I'm very happy to see that I ended at the right slide. It's a typical example of transactional leadership. Uh, look it up. There is uh, literature about that. Um, and it's basically this differentiation between transactional and transformational leadership uh, really is based on management literature. And it is something that you see in a higher education context, which has always been my kind of business. Um, you, you, see, you see this contrast in quite a few places. Now, I, I happen to know that some ex-colleagues of mine have uh, snuck into this session. Um, so, um, um, I, I'm going to keep the anecdotes as kind of carefully organized, uh, carefully worded as possible. Um, but I think it's important to reflect on the experiences made and to look at where, where, where does the organizational context fit in. You are currently studying at the university. So some of those things may or may not be applying to it. So have a look at how the people who are working there, whom you are working with, the people that are, that, that are working to help you succeed, what type of leadership are they working with? And that may give you an, uh, give you an indication as to the, the advantages that come from this leadership style, as well, obviously, as iniquities and, and, and problems. And none of those leadership styles are necessarily like better or less good. The decision that I've always seen myself as a servant leader or learned to become a servant leader um, has always been kind of, that's been a personal de decision of mine. Remember the disclaimer, this ain't science, this isn't academia, this is experience that I'm trying to share and hopefully can help you work on something relevant. Keep adding to the collaborative document, please. Yeah, uh, I would think that Alan Sugar is 
And that's the whole way the program really works. Um, a transactional leader sets expectations and controls and rewards or punishes um, non-compliance. That's in, in essence, it's, it's a deal. And that's very much the language on which the program, for example, is based as well. A lot of the cringe, and I can't watch The Apprentice, I just cannot, probably because I may have seen quite a lot of transactional leadership uh, over the years. The idea that I, as the leader, know best, and I decide, um, and that if you comply, and I set all the standards as well. There is not much room for co-creation, which is something that I'm obviously a big fan of. There's a kind of the contrast to that. So there's, if you basically got that on a spectrum, is uh, transformational leadership. Now, <laughs> yes, transformational leadership tries to help uh, set set lead the leader up. Oh, this obviously my uh, my notes have just disappeared. But transfer transformational leadership has at its aim to uh, get would basically probably if you basically say like a, the idea is that leadership inspires. There is an element of thought leadership in there. So it's not just someone who whom you are kind of who who is an accountant of your performance, but is someone who tries to inspire everyone to kind of go beyond uh, kind of some of their parts. So there is a, there's an element of uh, synergistic thinking, I think, in transformational leadership. Uh, what I find interesting is that transformational leadership has has been a uh, has been claimed by many an organization that in the end ends up as transactional, because the idea that transformational leader uh, can turn an organization based on their vision and wisdom uh, into a into a success, uh, that's something that's being seen as a, a, a quite quite attractive in many cases. It does make me a little bit nervous uh, because I often have thought that. I end up with uh, uh, that. I uh, that ends ends up with uh, hidden transformational leadership, just as is, and that is frustrating because, to a certain extent, one can feel a little bit duped by that. Uh, but then, corporate communications are often built uh, on the idea that you are um, trying to portray a much more positive image as you join, um, then is actually the reality. So when you're joining organizations, when you're in a hiring process, have a look what how the leadership speaks about itself, but how you see the organizational uh, organization acting. So again, it's transformational leadership is about idealized influence. It's about inspirational motivation. And actually one of the one of the worst leaders I've ever worked for um, was one of the most convincing visionary speakers that I've, I've worked with. And this, is, this is a long time ago. It was really interesting. Someone who really about two years later fairly crashed and burned on induction day at the place I was working held such a rousing speech, I think this is absolutely the right place. I did stay at that place for a number of years. I was very happy there, but in a sense, it was chaos. The true leader stands with you in the best and the worst conditions because that is the pillar for building a team. Uh, yes, but I'll, I'll come to that. Um, this focus is very much on the leader itself. So you still have a bit of a top-down model there. Um, transactional, um, um, a, uh, um, an, an, a, um, a, a, sorry, a, a transformational leader still gives you a lot of intellectual stimulation as someone who will want you to succeed. Where does common sense leadership come in? 
Hmm. Do you want me to go on to a rant on common sense? Because I think that is a very problematic term. Uh, I have to say that a lot of common sense doesn't come into organizational leadership in my way, if I, in my view, if I may have to say that. Um, but there is in general with transformational leadership also the idea that um, that uh, uh, the leader nurtures the uh, role towards, and that's an interesting word really, followers. So somehow I think the idea that a transformational leader nowadays tries to basically an influencer. And the problem that I have with that is that it's still a top-down based approach. And in my view and in my experience, I hope that I have um, come to practice that when I was still in leadership positions, um, was to be everyone else's, well, servant really. Um, why? Because we're well, on that screen with the, uh, with the fish that it's actually a, a gift, so they should actually be moving around there a little bit. I once heard a very, well, there are two quotes. Uh, one is uh, from the, uh, it's not verbatim, is from the uh, Tao Te Ching, uh, written by Lao Tzu, which is the basically foundational text for Taoism. And uh, this, uh, what was it? You, you reign a large country. Uh, the best way to basically to reign over a large country is how you um, fry a small fish, very little. That's the first one. So small interventions rather than big, broad strokes. The other one is, and that's why I've got the fish picture there, is uh, I've always seen, and anyone who's worked with me will probably have been told this terrible, uh, uh, so this is a simile rather than a metaphor, I think. And that is that uh, a manager or leader uh, it's basically it's like looking after an aquarium. You spend, if you have an aquarium, you spend a lot of time making sure that the water quality is good. Um, the fish know what to do. Fish know how to be fish, but the responsibility, the person who holds it together, is uh, good leadership is trusting your team. Yeah, the fish know what to do. Your job is to make sure that the environment doesn't poison them. So the idea of servant leadership. And I think while it, why it has served me so well over the years is, uh, <laughs> spoil with too much poking. Yes, yes, Stella, I absolutely agree. Um, uh, is to make sure everyone is all right. You set others, um, you set others are more important. This is serving the greater good. So the institutional, and societal mission, because we've got some big problems, which societally, which will not be fixed uh, by even individual, even large corporate actors. Um, they put team and organization first and not their own objectives. Anyone who's worked with me, um, um, anyone, anyone who's worked with me, again, will have probably heard this at some point, when I used to set uh, KPIs or targets and objectives, I uh, always built in for the team an objective. And that was when they see someone else struggling, helping someone else fulfill their objective is more important than getting the gold star for you over performing. It is about everyone working stronger together. So it's the strong support for the employees, which I hope I have been able to do uh, while I was in leadership positions. What types of leadership positions have I been in? I obviously started out basically just as a hiring manager. Uh, my first direct report, I pretty much ruined within the first six months. I had no idea how to lead and I had no idea how to look after someone. And they left because they didn't like their job and working with me. And over the years, I've hired a lot of people. I've built teams. I've built teams on separate locations. I've run remote teams. I've run teams, small teams in large organizations, relatively large teams, up to was it 15, I think, at some point, two uh, teams 
with a budget of about three quarters of a million. That was kind of the largest role. And I was an elected board member for a university and have actually gone through the uh, step when the university during COVID times changed ownership. So I always make the joke that uh, the biggest thing I ever sold was a university. It's obviously not true because I didn't, but I was part of a leadership team that had to do something, uh, had to do that. And I, I can tell you that was obviously in terms of, especially when you're trying to nurture people through such a time of, uh, of uh, insecurity, um, can't say I got everything right there. I'm fairly sure I made a lot of mistakes in that. But the leadership approach always has to take on the fact that the leader is human after all. Right. So these are the types of leadership that I wanted to kind of uh, introduce you to and why I think that, uh, that um, servant leadership which is not based on power distance, as Hofstede would say, uh, is in my view the one that gives under current circumstances the same results. I am sort of a psychologist enough to understand that you're in different times and during different societal circumstances, other forms of leadership will have helped achieve other things. But we've gone through, we're going through a fourth industrial revolution we're going through a change. Um, the World Economic Forum said in 2020 or 2019 that by 2025, 40% of the world workforce worldwide will have had to basically change their jobs or relearn their jobs. So we're, uh, that's you too. Just because you're coming out of university does not necessarily mean that you won't be expected to immediately retrain. I work now for a, um, uh, uh, coding school worldwide that trains coders in developing countries completely remotely with a completely different approach to leadership and I have to say big compliments to my organization first of all for kind of letting me do this today but also uh, for their completely different approach to anything I had experienced so far so I'm now a learner again I'm not in a leadership position in this organization and I find it absolutely fascinating um, how differently that is led and interestingly enough if we're not going back to the kind of middle-aged white man uh, thing the boomer basically um, this organization is led by much more your kind of closer to your peer group in a wider sense mostly led by millennials and i've never worked for an organization that clearly cared as much and applied a very different approach towards leadership but also management than the one I'm experiencing. That gives me hope that there's actual change towards the very fossilized dinosaur type leadership that exists. And well, <laughs> as it's my profession, I think I can say this, and pretty much I think persists in academia a lot. I always have the feeling that there's a little bit of a lag happening. I hope I get invited again, but I have to say it. I'm going to now confront you with two perspectives which have influenced my thinking about um, leadership. Oh, well, one actually about leadership and one about resilience. Expect a rant on resilience, but I think it will be becoming fairly clear on the uh, slide after this. So Robert Peston, and I think he and I, <laughs> I do disagree with him on quite a lot of things. I found this book quite annoying that I was reading, but it confronted me with some uh, interesting perspectives. And I kind of looked it up this morning because there was something in there that made me think of the topic we're talking about. What he basically says is, where, where are you, Robert? What he basically says is that technological progress and kind of the fairly brutal cleansing of low performing businesses from the last financial crisis have not led to increased productivity. And he was speaking specifically for the UK and it should have done that. And it has happened in other developed countries. So, and um, astonishingly, I'm not going to delve into the B word here because this actually precedes the Brexit um, 
uh, decision. But what he's basically saying is, and that's fairly grim, is that generally management and leadership standards in UK companies are in fact so bad that productivity is lagging behind comparable other econ large economies. And there's no improvement even during times of change and opportunity. And whenever uh, an economist starting to talk about change and opportunity always makes me a bit nervous. But again, let's stick with his thought. Part of what he makes this responsible for is, as he says, there's a culture of mutual accept acceptance of second best. Uh, so it's much less stressful than striving for perfection, trigger word, and it is hard to come by with a more compelling explanation why so many British companies are substandard than their respective bosses are inferior compared with their overseas rivals. So what he's saying is, in the UK, you have some global, global oriented and sometimes ad led and owned organizations who are outperforming the rest so much that if they weren't there, the economy would really be in massive trouble. Again, this is even pre-Brexit, COVID, war, all the fun stuff we started adding in the 2020s. So what does that say? It says that bad leadership, outdated leadership models are hmm, effectively don't work. They are affecting productivity badly and they are setting a lot of businesses onto very shaky ground. That is why I think as you go into the workplaces, there is a mission for you there and that is to change and revolutionize the way we're looking at leadership. That's your mission and I hope I'm going to see stuff in the collaborative document. Probably I'll see more than I can handle. Unsustainable, yeah, well yeah, unsustainable goals, but it's also, it's a question of the type of goal setting and performance and management, but also of leadership and how people see themselves, whether they think this is all right the way we're doing it has always worked this way. I'm not going to go into much detail, but this, I read this one, did the book come out like 2017? Oh, oh yeah, my good old friend deregulation and emphasis on profit making. Let me say, yes, uh, I have grown up in the age of, uh, of uh, uh, neoliberalism. And this is, in my view, one of the fruits uh, who are bearing from this. Yay, let me think. I don't have the right, oh yes, I do have the right emoji for that one. So let's have a, uh, let, let's, let's have a look. So that's, that's one thing that has impacted my thinking about this topic for a number of years because I consistently remember this about this. And I know I've left the UK uh, re kind of recently, but it is a malaise that obviously affects a lot of organization and kind of transcends borders to a certain extent. As you are going into a wider UK uh, and surrounding countries uh, employment market, it's one of the things to think about. How is the organization you're joining led? What's their philosophy? And do you align with that? A lot of people are rethinking this post, well post, during the pandemic, because they are starting to think about is what I do actually worth it? And part of my change to work, yeah, it absolutely does. There's amazing opportunity, not only for you to join organizations that are led in a different way, but to, from the start, not replicate the leadership model that people will possibly want you to uh, apply. That's one thought. Uh, there's another one, and I may raise some eyebrows about this one. Uh, if you are interested in anything that is HR or um, kind of work culture related, um, you, there's a very, very good, it's actually an alumna from Regents University where I used to work many years. 
is an alumna, an, an alum from that uh, organization. That is, uh, she's called uh, Laurie Rittiman, and she runs a kind of consultancy called Punk Rock HR, and is a blogger and writer. And she actually has quite some good uh, LinkedIn learning courses going as well, besides being a really nice person. Um, this is grabbed from one of her blog posts, which I, yeah, well, I said, I, I promised you a rant when it comes to the topic of resilience. What she basically states is that resilience is a trauma response. It's not a skill to pursue or develop. And I'm pretty sure that may be a slightly outlier position. Um, let me put it this way from my perspective. Um, resilience is like first aid and let's say self-defense. There's things that you apply in an emergency situation and it basically always sucks when you do. I think that's as far as I can go with language. It's a response to systemic collapse. Anyone notice COVID? A lot of talk about resilience during that time. Um, so instead of kind of walking around patting people on the back for being resilient, yay, you're so resilient, we should acknowledge that they've what they've been through and help them and ask ourselves how to prevent failure in the future. Resilience is not a skill to pursue or to develop. It's an outcome of societal negligence and an opportunity to endure a situation to make life better for us. It's a precursor for empathy and should be a cornerstone of action. What's the alternative? Ha! Well, okay, Mara. Um, I just like, and I am someone who's trained self-defense all their life and uh, has some first aid knowledge. Yes, resilience in principle as a kind of, um, as, as a, as a, as a oh, it's trainable skill. Re strengthening your resilience is in principle a good thing. But the point that is being made here is that society and the economy and your employer shouldn't rely on you to be resilient in order to function in, in under normal conditions. If your normal condition is that you have to be resilient, then there's something wrong with your normal conditions. And they are, normality should not cost you, um, should not cost you um, uh, uh, strength. You shouldn't burn out just by, all, by normality. How does that link to leadership? In organization that goes straight into the organizational leadership. In the collaborative manifesto document, I put on like one, first point right away at the beginning and i said something like please load uh oh my this is a lot uh okay i can't find it anymore because people have been writing so much yeah here it is i get off at mindfulness when i'm overworked that's the one thing i put in here let's kind of pick this up as bit of a um i didn't see lcbitas uh can that be it's Peter, can you can you repost this? Because there I, I couldn't see what people liked so much. And it's kind of yes, it's a fels to fels offense. Yes, yeah, well, I absolutely agree. So and this is a situation that for me is an absolute red flag in an organization. People are signaling they're overworked. For everyone as a leader, institutional leader, organizational leader is worth their salt. That's the moment to think about can we optimize or improve the way our systems work? Do we in the end need to invest into more staff? But in many cases, in many organizations, actually inefficiencies drain out the power. People can do, but if only 20% of the work you do actually hits the spot and 80% is maintaining operations, then it's the leadership's role to start shifting that and change that. I have, and really, almost every organization I've worked in, I have raised this, and in almost every organization, the immediate response when you voice this, for example, to the HR team, it's, oh, we've got mindfulness courses, we've got support for you. Now, I'll hold back on mindfulness because that is another rant, but uh, how can I put this? I have lived in a Buddhist temple in Japan for a while, and I've got some idea with regards to meditation. And uh, 
I've got my views on mindfulness as it is being practiced and brought forward. But let's pick this up. It's, it's the socialization of being responsible for the pressure that is put on you, rather than the leadership of an organization trying to reduce the pressure and create that environment to unpoison the aquarium that we were talking about. And uh, yeah, that is, and I think that's the difference between management and leadership and where servant leadership again comes in, where you don't stand at the top and say, I know best, but where you're based on listening and improving things for everyone so that everyone in the organization can actually live up to their, the, to their uh, potential. Right, 12 minutes left. Not everyone has left yet or fallen asleep. I'm very, very happy. So let's have a look what people have read in there. Uh, is it okay? And I don't, I'm not going to ask people to like switch our camera on and talk. You can if you want to. But I'm going to pick up uh, from the collaborative document things that really stick out to me. And I'm going to ask a question. So you can obviously all see it. Oh, let's turn this around maybe. Is there a specific comment that you think is worth further um, uh, discussion, whether it's yours or someone else's, start putting them into the chat. I will also read this and pick up things that I find interesting. <sighs> yeah, um, I'm very tempted to go to my Twitter timeline because there's something here when the leader does not respect the team. Right, I see people are starting to copy. Right, okay. I'll, I'll see what comes into the chat. So there was a there was a Twitter exchange this morning, and someone was posting, "How did you mark yourself out as a troublemaker in your organization?" And uh, I posted saying, "Well, I think I did that probably by uh, being relatively fresh on the board and uh, asking the executive how they were going to address the 27% drop in um, uh, staff trust in their leadership." and I know that sounds provocative, but any middle manager who had anywhere 27% drop in any of their areas of expertise, you're uh, in trouble. Um, this is copying everything. I mean, it's all cool, but leadership red flags, that is quite the thing. Um, single points. Let me see. Um listening to others opinions yet yeah, we're all responsible for that because we will sometimes over we will sometimes only be open to hear our own voices but good leadership puts processes in place that stops them from doing that uh did anyone go to the design thinking session uh this morning what and see the recording i haven't seen it but that's one of the tenets of design thinking that you design a process that starts filtering out the not listening part and gives you an opportunity to understand and listen fully. Uh, excellent, Majid. Top marks there, because that's normally one of the tenets, really, uh, uh, of design of design thinking. And uh, I that's one of the reasons why this uh, has always appealed to me. Uh, sorry for everyone who's ever worked with me and I've made through going through design thinking exercises because they're obviously occasionally quite annoying as well. Um, how will I lead? <laughs> competently. Right in the chat, what is competently? Or oh, right in there, clarify what is competent leadership? Doing all the things that Matthias said in his talk. Yay, I'm good with that. Uh, Use my team's qualifications and experience, their wisdom. Uh, that's lovely because um, <laughs> having worked in academic settings, one of the things that I've seen specifically actually in business school settings, and again, this is through the board, no one specifically named here, but you have sometimes well-known marketing academics and you sometimes have a completely separate marketing department and the two don't speak. So qualifications, experience and wisdom, especially when you are in a place that does management education, you would expect 
proper management really <laughs> to actually be applied. Competence is knowledge and the proper application of that knowledge to required processes. So this is technocratic, but yeah, um, put it right into there. Acknowledge there are people that will know better than you. Trust them to take the lead. That's why you hired them. Absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. And that's very hard because when we're going back to that old school, uh, Alan Sugar, well, Alan Sugar, the TV personality. Remember, this is this is edutainment. Um, sorry, entre uh, what is it called? Entertainment. Entertainment. Um, uh, the The Apprentice. This is obviously this is a show and is cut and edited to be weirdly compelling and entertaining. But if you've gone through uh, a culture of leadership that is all on your own shoulders and you're always expected to be the smartest, the most experienced, the best, the most technically advanced, whatever person in the room, and you've done that for long enough, it's very hard to step out of that and let others take the lead. So what I'm saying is when you're looking at the leadership in your organizations, and you look up and you don't understand what they do and you disagree vehemently. Keep in mind that these are people who've got maybe decades of experience that have taught them to be who they are and their organizational cultures, which eat strategy for breakfast. Uh, and the setting in which they grew up, and I can say that as I kind of well, I've hit the 50 now, um, to see that you've learned in specific ways. It is very hard to sit back and think, well, all the things I built my career on are like becoming wrong now. For me, the proper leadership can motivate others to a new level of excellence. They are inspirational. Yes, as long, in my view, as better, uh, as long as that inspiration is shared and it is not just on one person. We've got five minutes to go. I hope you got some value uh, from this session. Again, personal experience, uh, obviously anecdotal and not an academic seminar. Uh, by what I'm getting from you on the chat, as well as in the document, I'm amazed by what, by what you're contributing. But if anyone wants to pick up now and help us close this, I hope you got some, I don't want you to come out with knowledge, I want you to come out with impulses, with ideas to think about how you're going to develop your relationship with leadership, but also ancillary issues such as management, excellence and resilience. I hope you come out inspired and hmm, with ideas. Here ended the show. How can I help? Thank you very, very much, Matthias. Absolutely brilliant. And again, it, it, it sort of turns that academic side of things and, and, you know, the theoretical side of things in terms of what leadership and followership is, you know, and I think it's particularly important for, for our students to realize that, that there is a change. There's a, the, 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 the sands are shifting slowly, I, I would, would, <laughs> would argue, uh, you know, in terms of leadership and management. And I think, you know, with, with, with the pandemic and, you know, people working from home and, you know, being managed differently yeah. and being led differently, it's, it has led to a seismic shift, you know, even within our own organization in terms of, you know, flexible working frameworks. Uh, you know, they yeah. can't call it a policy because it doesn't apply to everybody because academics and professional services have different contracts and stuff. <laughs> So, you know, there's, the, you know, and you, you know this yourself from the work that you've done, you know, that the, yes. the, there is that element of, of trust and trust becomes a really, really important factor when it, you know, it's, it's about the leader or the manager trusting the staff. And it's also about the trust of the, the staff and in, in, in the leader as well. So, no, thank you very, very much. It's, it's, it's a lot of food for thought there. And again, some, some interesting, uh, you know, 
articles, books, you know, text that kind of get stuck into, you know, as as an aside at the end of the day. So absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Is anybody, we've got about three minutes, anybody, any quick questions they want to throw, throw out there before we wrap this up? I'm happy to read in the chat if no one wants to like speak up. That's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, knowledge of the audience, Norms. <laughs> Sorry, my name's Norm, and every time I see Norms, I have to laugh. Knowledge <laughs> of the audience, Norms and Cosby would be helpful for a leader to inspire them. This is everyone's here. Maybe it's not perfect. No, abs absolutely. And uh, the, the thing is, I mean, it is about knowing your team, and it's about getting to know your team. And, you know, I've always, uh, you know, for, for me, when I've, when I've been in leadership roles or responsibilities it's 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 not asking anybody to do something that i wouldn't do myself you know and i think i think that is important at yes. the end of the day but it's also about trusting the staff and letting them play to their strengths i seen that somebody had put in the your document your life document there you know it depends on circumstances depends on the personality of the team so that there are a lot of dependencies you know at the end of the day that i think people need to take into account but it's also about not being afraid to lead and one of the things you you said right at the top of the, the the session, Matthias, was, you know, about gaining opportunities to experience leadership roles so that you develop yeah. your style. You know, you kind of, you know, the, 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 you have a better understanding of what works and not what works, what doesn't work, you know, in, in different circumstances. So I think that, that that's really, really important. I just want to quickly and say I there think, are... I'm sorry, yes. That's, there that's are also number one of the things that you can pick from startup culture, and that is like fail early, fail often, which is why I very much enjoy in the organization that I mean now, there's experiments, that there is the, uh, that there is um, basically ask for forgiveness, just try something out. And if it's not perfect, no yeah. one will stand there and chastise you for it. That is absolutely essential, and I very much enjoy that. And it's very different to the early leadership culture that I was kind of, growing up with 20 years ago. Well, I, th I think it is certainly an improvement. And one of the things we talk to our students about, you know, fail is a first, you know, a first attempt in learning. Uh, you know, and I, I think it's about not being afraid to make mistakes, you know, and, yeah. and especially within a university environment, you know, yeah. where, where it's a much safer environment where the consequences of the mistakes may not be catastrophic in terms of commercial, you know, implosion or whatever. But I, but I, yeah. but I do, I, I do think there is, there is that, that change of, you know, and I was in interested in the, the kind of Alan Sugar, Sir Alan Sugar, Lord Sugar, whatever he is these days, you know, that, that kind of middle-aged white kind of, you know, male figure of leadership. And, uh, you know, the, there is a change and, and, oh. and, and it's great to see that change. Um, and then glass yes. ceilings are being broken, you know, politically, economically, commercially, um, slowly, I, you know, I will say before any anybody yeah. jumps more in of, More of that, please. More of that, please. I mean, this is this yeah. is what I always then basically say, let's foment a little bit of revolution. Be active. Go beyond the workplace. Join a union. Build your own squad of, 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 of people you're networked with beyond. Look around you. The people you're studying with may in many ways be the people who will be going with you through uh, through your professional life as well afterwards. Build Absolutely. networks that help you deal with impact and to be fair again uh, to people, uh, to kind of leaders who have kind of grown up in a specific system and then coming in. I remember after a very, very old school type of leadership in a previous institution, we had a new vice chancellor coming in who clearly was trying to change an institution and really, really didn't, well, didn't want to change culture, eat strategy for breakfast. That is such hard work. So even if you try to be an agent of change, it's like walking through a swamp in many cases. I like I like Magnus as long as it's not nuclear. <laughs> it's not nuclear. <laughs> as long as you're not pushing the button. Listen, Matthias, yeah. thank you very, very much. It's been great to you're connect with you. It's been great to work with you over the last couple of weeks to get all this, you know, up and running. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a, we know it's been a trial of, of you know, of love at times, uh, to be honest. And it, it's great. So, you know, it's, a, it, it's absolutely Trinkle, brilliant. Yes. brilliant. We, we, we have another, we have another couple of sessions running this afternoon. I've just put the slide up there if you go to the Ulster Skills backslash Skills Week there's some some really excellent ones and I think probably the next one as well you know where we, we have somebody from Battle Space the office space it's it's going to offer a very different perspective potentially 
on leadership. So that's you know, I and thought, it's great. I this thought, is the I thing. thought they might. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, um, but that's the thing. You know, it does. You know, it 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 depends on circumstances sometimes and the, the different types of leadership. But this is you know, it's, yes. it's one that you know I'm I'm really looking forward to in terms of how, you know, the, 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 there is that 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 crossover potentially and the learning from one to the other. So you know, I think that that's really important. Uh, We'll also say we have a number of uh, sessions running tomorrow as well. We have, you know, uh, Kate Rooney, we have Sarah Travis, we have David Mead. And uh, so, you know, a great, great set of sessions, uh, you know, running tomorrow as well. So again, Matthias, on behalf of myself and, and the students and, and, and the other staff members who are, who are in the session here, thank you very, very much. Really, really appreciate it. And to the students, again, thank you very, very much for your for your input, both, you know, in terms of the 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 Mendy uh, in terms of the Google Doc that Matthias has set up and also in relation to the chat bar, it really makes it, it, it you know, a much more interesting interactive of session. And Matthias, look, I will be in touch uh, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get together at some point in the not too distant future and, and we'll I'm, get that I'm right. only down so the <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, right. listen, thank you very thank much, you. everybody. I'm going to stop the, the recording now and leave the session.